Lancashire from 1975 until 1980. He became known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Sutcliffe was eventually captured and convicted of 13 murders and seven attempted murders. Now, following Sutcliffe's death, the son of the first woman to be murdered by him has asked for people to stop referring to Sutcliffe as the Ripper. Richard McCann, whose mum, Wilma, was murdered by Sutcliffe in 1975, says using the R word, as he calls it, to describe the perpetrator, brings back the trauma and grief which he and the family members of other victims live with because it refers to the way he mutilated the women he killed. Richard also says it glamorizes Sutcliffe's crimes and gives him a cult-like status. So I'm joined now by Richard McCann and your mum's at the centre of all of this. And Richard, when I think of your mum, Wilma, I think of one particular photo that the police released. Yeah, that'll be the one, the, the black and white one that we were subjected to, which was, I think was taken when she was 18 and had been arrested for shoplifting. So it's quite a, a, a sombre picture, not the, not the, the happy memories that I have of my mum. So um, good afternoon, by the way. Good afternoon, and uh, I've watched a little film you've done on YouTube where you go through the other photos, and it gives me a completely different view of, of your mum, because as you say, I've only ever seen, until I watched that, I've only ever seen that one mugshot where she looks um, at a loss, really. Yeah, and it always reminded me of Myra Hindley did, did that photograph. Um, what, what, what we're trying to do, by the way, is we're trying to recreate the, you know, the 13 photographs that we've all seen over the years, um, we're going to try and recreate them. So not just my mum's picture is corrected with a more holistic look, shall we say. Um, but we're going to get them all done. So they're all in colour. So, uh, so that'll be something nice to look forward to. We'll come on and talk about the, the name given to Sutcliffe over the years in a moment. But just tell us about when you lost your mum, how old you were and where you were. Well, we were at home. It was a week before my sixth birthday. And... It, it's it's just a night that's etched in my memory that I'll never forget that that sleepless night. You know, Mum had been out drinking, and uh, my elder sister Sonia shook me awake and 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 told me that Mum hadn't come home, which felt really surreal. So I followed her lead, and we left the house and we walked down that cold, dark path on the field at the back of the house, looking for her, and eventually ended up at the bus stop, and we waited for an, an hour or so, and it just. Be- just because it was so surreal and of course what it led on to and what we discovered later that day it's just an emotional memory that I'll never uh, forget what what's remarkable about that walk down that path is that is exactly where she was and I'm just so grateful as I look back that it was October and and dark and not light because that would have been a whole different story had we found my mum's body Mm. So what what we now know is that she was a victim of Peter Sutcliffe and and he just pounced on her. Well, the the, the, the fact is he, she she was she asked for a lift home and he gave her a lift. Some people turned her down and they came forward later to you know, obviously full of regret. But he gave her a lift home and it, and it wasn't that far. It was probably a third or a half a mile from where she had her last drink. He gave her a lift home and you know took her drove her into the car park at the back of the house and you know. If you what if you read his statement, he he talks about her offering sex to him, um, and 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 obviously we know what happened then. And forty five mm. years ago it is, and we've also had to live with that all these years and and come to terms with that. Um, but it's been harder to come to terms with it because of that name he was given, and that reminder, that continuous reminder of I guess what he did to to many of the many of the victims because that's that's what that name is. It's a description of how. Um, women can be killed. And, uh, and in the 70s, when that name was applied to the then unknown man who was doing all this, it, nobody complained as, as, as you're complaining. Now, we're a different kind of society, I guess. The police went in with their very large DMs on everything. Yeah, they, they did. And you'd like to think that things... Well, they have, uh, you know, changed. There's still some work to do, but I was so grateful to finally get that um, apology from West Yorkshire Police um, on the day that he died, in fact. So that, that, that was, you know, if we can take something positive from the whole saga, uh, it's that they finally uh, gave in and gave us that apology, which, which was, um, uh, as oft- has been said, is long overdue. Did you, had you complained, Richard, for a long time about the, the words, the Yorkshire Ripper? Is that, is that something you'd objected to, or did you wait to properly complain until Sutcliffe died? No, I, I I wrote to West Yorkshire Police earlier in the year, got some help from a friend of mine, um, 
a very well written letter uh, asking for that apology and you know I, I didn't I didn't get it I didn't get it didn't, I didn't uh, I had to call a couple of times to say is there, are we going to get a response and, and and then we had COVID of course but we nine months we waited and then on the day that he died you know I did, I did a few media interviews and I took that opportunity to finally not demand, you know, but invite them to make the apology. And, and you know, they, they did. So I was grateful for that. I'm just a bit disappointed that it... Well, first of all, I'm disappointed that they spoke about our mothers, some of them anyway, some of them deserving almost of what they got. I'm sorry that they went through that, but I'm grateful in the end that we, we got that apology. Because w when we think of that gallery of those poor women who were murdered, they, a, a lot, the police basically framed a lot of them as prostitutes. That was how it was said. And, and I suppose almost all of them went into the public mind that that is, that's who they were and that's how they died. That, I mean, it started with my mum. Well, it's the, the first person to die that we know of was my mum. And straight away, because my mum was, you know, she was, their words, a good time girl. She would go out and, uh, you know, she'd, she'd get off with men. And uh, But she, she certainly didn't have a conviction for prostitution. But because they assumed, because of her lifestyle and I guess her, uh, I guess her promiscuity, that she was a prostitute. Uh, by the way, my, my mum's family demanded that they took that, retracted that, and it never happened. Um, but because they thought that about her, and then the second woman to die, uh, um, Emily Jackson, was a known prostitute, I, I think from then on they, they assumed um, that they, they initially all were. Iron Richardson, the third person to die, um, wasn't a prostitute, and um, but but they kind of they made that wrong assumption, and it's because they made those wrong assumptions that somebody in the media came up with that term, linking it to the Victorian serial killer of a similar name, and I, I guess because they did that, it won it, it well. It, it inspired didn't it, the John Humble, the hoaxer, to write a similar letter and then tapes to West Yorkshire Police, goading them. But those letters were copied off very similar letters that the the the, the Victorian killer made. So, had they not called them this, the, the Yorkshire R, shall we say, and um, that wouldn't have happened. And because that happened, three women died. Uh, but because they also that they call him that name, it mythologizes him and almost makes him a larger than life character and it, I, I wonder whether or not that actually inspired him to go and do more because oh I've got this term now I'm almost I've got a brand uh, so uh, it's so disappointing that well even today it's so disappointing that we hear it uh, over and over again possibly inspiring the next serial killer no it's, it's a very good point and I'm, I'm going to correct my own language in the light of what you said because to be honest with you I had not really thought about it because it, it has been used as the the label for so long since I, I'm a little bit older than you, but I mean, I, I came into adolescence with a, an awareness of this murder. And I guess at the time we didn't have his name. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and of course, what happened with your mum and, and what was so awful was that when a 16 year old woman called Jay McDonald became the fifth victim, the police then said, well, now he's made a mistake and he's moved on to innocent victims and that was infuriating yeah it, it not that i knew the detail at the time um because i'll have been what was i 77 so i'll have been eight or nine um so i didn't see that distinction being made as a young child it wasn't until i, I kind of got older jay mcdonald they were all i mean it wasn't just the police by the way because the media the auction evening post did a similar piece about uh, him now killing innocent victims they're all innocent every one of those women had a right to live and so so to to, to think of them saying that and um, just well begs belief doesn't it i suppose we we do in criminal history we do label people and you think of jack the r uh, from the victorian era and so on um and and maybe we've we need to think again about the way we do that because it doesn't it may you're right it encourages people who want a name for themselves they want the label to do terrible things Absolutely. I, I, I put a press release out a couple of weeks ago asking the media to stop calling him and others like him by that pseudonym. And the ironic thing was a lot of them put the big R word on the article and then quoted what I had to say. So they, they didn't follow suit. They didn't take pay any attention. And uh, I'm going to do a campaign. We are going to do a campaign to ask the, kind of, uh, the press to be given some guidelines that going forward. So if some good can come out of this, some guidelines can be given for those in the media that when referring to serial serious criminals like this not to give them those monikers those names because it doesn't it doesn't do anything 
uh, but encourage um, maybe the next prolific criminal and and other things. It's, it's a big subject, isn't it? I know you've given interviews for a Netflix documentary which is coming out tomorrow that was going to be called Once Upon a Time in Yorkshire. They've now changed the title, I gather. They have. They, they've taken that. And, and I heard from, from, from Kate, uh, one of the senior commissioning editors at Netflix last night, in fact, and I, I was gobsmacked. I was heartbroken to hear that she said to me, if they'd have known that we'd have objected, they would have changed it. Now, when I was told by the production company that this is now the new name, I was told... Sorry, Rude, I haven't said what the name is, but you should say it. Or maybe I should, because I haven't, we haven't made it, but it's, it's the R word, right? I'm, so it's I, called... I, I, I'm going to say it, to, to make the point, because I think it's valid. It's called The Ripper, which is, the, the, which is nothing like Once Upon a Time in Yorkshire. My point is, no. she said that they would have changed it if there's any objections, but the production company told me there's nothing we can do the name's been chosen that's it so we weren't given the i guess the the option to object um or that's what we were to be so apparently there's been some miscommunication but what a what a miscommunication um, mm. oh and it's, it's terrible if if i mean you wouldn't have taken part in it if you'd known that was the title i can tell from what you've said would I, you I, I wouldn't and i was reassured that that it was all going to be going to be done sensitively the, the stupid thing is the program itself, because I've watched all four uh, episodes, is done really well and is done sensitively. So it just it just they, they've all, they've just like wasted all that sensitivity by calling it that name, and um, mm. it's just it's just disappointing. But it is it, it is what it is. We have to take it on the chin like we have done for last or we have done for forty five years. Uh, Netflix have have said I should say that this is a sensitive re-examination of the crimes. And the series has at its heart the stories of the women who died. And we should end where we began, Richard, with, with your memories of your mother, because your film on YouTube is shows a life, not just the snapshot. No, and, 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 it's, and I think we want those women to be remembered in, in the right way. Just before I go, we, we're trying to create this a, a woman's um, memory garden for the women to remember in Leeds. Uh, so we're, on the, on, we're on, the, on the go with that. And uh, details of that are on my website, Rich McCann, on my, on my uh, blog. So uh, we invite people to support us in that if they can. Thank you very much, Richard. Very really good to speak to you. Take care. Take care. Richard McCann, who uh, now actually is a motivational speaker, so you can hear him speak about what happened to his life after that terrible morning. Imagine him as a five-year-old going out to look for his mother, who was the first known victim of Peter Sutcliffe. Let me get it into my head that that's what we call him now. We do not use the label.